product owner, I don't have any guidance, and uh, I made a bunch of mistakes, and so this is kind of therapy for me, uh, decompressing after that experience, uh, and realizing a lot of the things that I did were kind of wrong. Um, I should say, since I'm representing Dorex Studios, that my comments today do not reflect the current state of the product, which I haven't worked on for two years, and are in no way representative of Dorex Studios. Um, so, uh, my point that I'm going to be making today is this. Uh, I think the dominant paradigm for product management is wrong and or poorly specified. Um, lots of people think about innovation and product development in general as if we were building trust bridges, which can be easily modeled and possess linear characteristics, and uh, where most of the thinking is in creating the specification rather than in actually building the product. Um, and that's crap. Um, we need to think differently about the way we measure cost, and in particular do less of it, and the way we measure value, and do more of that, and also the way we manage portfolios of products. And in particular, think differently about culture and what kind of organizational culture is required for innovation. So if none of this is interesting to you, now would be a good time to go and see one of the other fine talks that are going on right now. Hello, I went to the back. So, I was made a product manager at Go, uh, at CoreWorks uh, in 2008. And, uh, I had no idea how to do product management, and ThoughtWorks attitude, basically, to giving someone a new job is to say, you seem like you're not wildly incompetent, go and do this. And uh, that's pretty much it. <laughs> uh, so you're, I thought, well, you know, uh, I've heard of this thing called Scrum, let's find out what that says about product management. And uh, again, this is no way representative of Scrum, it's how I understood Scrum at the time. Uh, and basically what it said is, Work out what you're going to build, get a big list of requirements, prioritize it, estimate it, build it, and then as a product manager you have to give feedback to the team when they build the stuff you told them to build. Off you go. And uh, so that's what I did. And it turns out, as a product manager, uh, it's really easy to come up with requirements. I came up with loads and loads of requirements, I came up with hundreds of those things. And uh, that was fabulous, and I had this great idea about how great the product was going to be.
So, valuable software. What is valuable software? Um, the Agile Manifesto doesn't really give any guidance on this. And so, valuable software, what is value? So, was everyone at Mary Poppendick's talk this morning? Yeah, most of you, okay. So, she made this point about shareholder value. And shareholder value is this theory, um, US public companies are required to maximize shareholder value legally. And shareholders have taken companies to court for failing to maximize shareholder value and won. So it's kind of a serious thing. Um, and it came from these guys, Jensen and Meckling, um, who were academics who wrote a paper um, on this stuff. And, and for some reason, it went into law really quickly. So the only time the US government seems to adopt academic research is uh, when it's likely to screw things up really badly, uh, as far as I can work out. And this is one of the cases where this is really true. Um, fiduciary duty means you can get sued if you don't do it, uh, or um, and so forth. So as Mary said, what shareholder value has done is presided over um, <laughs> a decrease in shareholder value, a, de a decline in the return on both on equity investment and capital investment, accompanied by an eightfold increase in CEO compensation from 1980 to 2000. So somebody has benefited from this, but it turns out not to have been the shareholders. So maximizing shareholder value turns out to be a very bad way or focusing on maximizing shareholder value turns out to be a very bad way to actually maximize shareholder value. So that's unfortunate. Um, there's seats kind of over here somewhere if you'd like to sit down. Um, if you prefer to stand, that's obviously, some people consider that healthy, so I'm standing. Um, so shareholder value. Focusing on this is a poor way to maximize shareholder value. And so companies which aim to do this or set out to do this, you should not invest in those companies. So let's look at a couple of companies who have a slightly different take on value. Uh, and I think have said some really cool things about value. So there's a company called SpaceX. Anyone heard of SpaceX? Okay, one guy here. Uh, anyone heard of Elon Musk? Okay, so a few people. Elon Musk was the founder of PayPal and well, one of the founders of PayPal, and, and PayPal did quite well, and uh, Elon Musk got quite rich. And Elon Musk um, decided, you know, he had all this money, and he didn't want to retire, because that was boring. So he invested in, well, he started up two companies. One was SpaceX, and um, SpaceX's mission statement, so SpaceX built this thing, which is the Phoenix module, and this docked recently with the International Space Station uh, a couple of months ago maybe three months ago, and it's the first privately created vehicle to have uh, docked with the International Space Station. Um, so he, in 10 years, maybe 15 years, he built a rocket ship and launched a space capsule that docked with the ISS, which is pretty cool. Um, what a guy. Um, and if you look at SpaceX's mission statement, it's this. The company was founded in 2002 by Elon Musk, 11 years, 11 years, to revolutionize space transportation and ultimately make it possible for people to live on other planets. <laughs> now that's what I call value. That's, that's a mission statement. And uh, I mean, this isn't, this, Elon Musk has toned it down for the corporate website because Elon Musk's stated goal is to retire on Mars. So, uh, this is, this, is, this is someone I, I kind of admire. Um, so this wasn't enough for Elon Musk. Elon Musk decided that, you know, this was going to keep him reasonably busy, but he had some other spare time, and what was he going to do with that? So he co-founded Tesla Motors. Anyone heard of Tesla Motors? Yeah, okay. So Tesla Motors' mission statement is this. Tesla Motors was founded in 2003 by a group of intrepid Silicon Valley engineers who set out to prove that electric vehicles could be awesome. Which, which again is a mission statement I can get behind. Um, so Elon Musk, uh, a really cool guy, and uh, obviously isn't focused on maximizing shareholder value, but is rather focused on doing things that are really awesome and uh, will probably have enormous benefits to humanity uh, as, as well, which, which is fabulous. Um, you know, his personal life's not going so well. He's just had his second divorce, so obviously there have been some sacrifices in the process of doing this, but you know, Fabulous entrepreneur. Um, so the second person that I want to introduce you to today is a guy called uh, Jack Andraka, who's, um, I think, uh, 15 years old. 
a uh, 15-year-old guy from Maryland. And he just won the 2012 Intel Science Fair Prize. And what he made is a diagnostic tool for pancreatic cancer after his uncle died from pancreatic cancer. Has anyone heard of this guy? Okay. So, uh, he, was, he was into science, and after his uncle died of pancreatic cancer, he decided he was going to try and do something about it. And so, um, he got access to a lab, and he started experimenting with antibodies and carbon nanotubes. And uh, he created um, this reproducible diagnostic test for pancreatic cancer using carbon nanotubes coated with antibodies. Uh, and this sensor is 100 times more selective than existing diagnostic tests. It's 168 times faster, and it's 26,000 times less expensive and 400 times more sensitive than the existing test for, for pancreatic cancer. 15 years old. Messing around with carbon nanotubes one day in the lab. And he does this. So that's pretty cool, I think. Um, and so, awesome guy. And I was kind of interested to see how he came to be able to do this kind of thing at 15 years old. So there's an interview with him, and he talks about this. And uh, this is what he has to say. His parents, he says, never really answered any of the questions that they had. Meaning he and his siblings. Go figure it out, figure it out for yourself, they'd say. I got really into the scientific method of developing a hypothesis and testing it and getting a result and going back to do it again. So, I'm, who in this room is a parent? Who has children? Okay, many of you. So, I have two little girls and obviously I want them to be fabulously successful and uh, run the world. And so I think a lot about how I'm going to help them become uh, uh, fabulous people. And, you know, I, I think a lot about how I'm going to educate them, this kind of thing. And so this is a bit of an eye-opener. His parents, he said, never really answered any of the questions they had. Go and work it out for yourself. That's an interesting approach to parenting. And uh, one that I hadn't really considered <laughs> until I saw this. But obviously it's been quite successful for uh, Jack and Draker. Um, so this idea of the scientific method turns out to be very important in product development and I'm going to talk a lot about the scientific method so hold this thought. Um, so going back to shareholder value, um, Mary Poppendick demolished that. Uh, there's a guy called Jack Welch who used to be CEO of uh, GE and uh, Jack Welch says this about shareholder value. Shareholder value is the dumbest idea in the world which is uh, a high bar. Um, it's a result, not a strategy. Your main constituencies are your employees, your customers, and your products. And so, if we want to create value, I think these are the three things we need to focus on. Employees, customers, and products. And those are the three things I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the session. So, let's think about customers and products. You might think if you want to build something valuable for your customers, maybe you should ask your customers what they want. Seems like a reasonable idea. Now, who's tried asking customers what they want? How did that work out for you? Faster horse. Yeah, faster horse, right. So that's, that's, the, that's a great quote. That's, I, don't, I don't think he actually said it. I tried to find out um, if Henry Ford actually said this, and I think it's apocryphal. But Henry Ford said that, if, you, if I'd asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Uh, so anyone who's actually spoken to customers will know that this quote I'm about to show you is true. Um, this is from Orson and Bell's book, Lean IT. Customers don't know what they want. I mean, so uh, my first job after college was building a, a product for some guy who had some money during the dot-com boom of the 2000s. And... Uh, he decided he was going to create a mail system and uh, it was going to involve having a picture of a desktop which actually looked like a desktop and having a dog that would run across the desktop graphically with your mail and show it to you. And that was his USP for his products. Uh, and it was a terrible idea, uh, basically because he didn't know anything about technology. Now, I read about technology all the time. It's my job to read the internet and find out what's going on in technology. And every day I read things that blow my mind. And I think, wow, that's really awesome. And that's my job. 
So if you think about our customers, you ask them what they want, they don't know what they want. They've got no idea what they want. They don't know what's possible. How could they know what they want? They can't, and they don't. And if you ask them, they come up with something. They'll make something up because they want to make you happy, you know, and give you an answer. But, um, you know, they, they won't tell you. It's, it's, a, it's hopeless. What customers are really good at doing is this. Customers can't tell you what they want, but they seem insistent about what they don't want. Ah! Oh! I've lost the rest of the quote. Um, this is bad. I know it off by heart. They seem insistent about, they, about what they don't want once you've built it and shown it to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, this is what customers are good at. Once you've actually built something and you show it to them, then they will tell you that that's not what they want. Customers are fabulous at doing that. And uh, so, this is what we really need to, to, to actually focus on. Um, so, the paradigm for product development, where we come up with a list of requirements, and then we actually go and build the thing, and then we show our customers to get feedback for them, that turns out to be wildly efficient as a way of delivering value, because it involves actually building the thing, which is the slowest possible thing you could do to actually gather feedback. So. Um, there's a guy called Eric Reese. Who's heard of Eric Reese? Um, yeah, all right. So uh, you know, the Lean Startup, which everyone who hasn't read it should go and read it because it's brilliant. And uh, basically, what he says um, is is this: uh, you need to start by having a vision for how you want to change the world. What are you going to do that's going to change the world? Um, and make uh, a business, probably a business canvas, not a business model, something lightweight, not something that's going to take you weeks, so you can sketch out in you know, uh, an hour or two and get feedback on. And then, build the minimum viable products. And what's the minimum viable products? So this turns out to be a contentious term, um, but what it is, essentially, is the least possible work you can possibly do to get feedback on your idea. And that might be, there's a great story from IBM. When IBM invented the computer, um, well, when they invented the commercial computer, I should say, because they were academic computers, when they invented the commercial computer, what they did is they, they had all this stuff and they had no idea what to do with it. And so they thought, some smart executive thought, well, maybe we could use it for taking dictation. That would be fabulous. And uh, he decided to test this idea. And the way they tested this idea, and this was in the, the 60s or something, is instead of actually building the software, which would have been very expensive, they got an executive in a room with a microphone and a screen. And in another room, they got a secretary with a keyboard and a loudspeaker. And they gave the executive the microphone and said, please dictate your letter. And the executive started dictating the letter and saying, Dear sir, um, I would like to, um, hang on, no, don't type, hang on. no, stop typing, no, don't type, no, stop. And it quickly became clear that this was not going to work and it was a rubbish idea. And here we are in 2013 and, you know, maybe some of you have Siri and Siri still is not fabulous at, at doing this kind of thing. So, building the MVP, running an experiment that preferably doesn't involve building any software to try and gather feedback on whether the idea is any good. So what's the smallest possible amount of work we can do to gather feedback on the, the idea without building software? And then do that as fast as possible. And keep going around that loop. And when you reach a local maximum, because iterative incremental development will get you somewhere, but it may not get you to the stage where you think, okay, this is good locally, but I need to change my business idea and come up with a different strategy to achieve my vision. Uh, when you reach a local maximum, you may need to pivot and change your business idea, change your strategy. So he has, Eric Reese's invention basically is this thing, the build, measure, learn loop. You have an idea, you build something, you get feedback, uh, you learn what to do next. And what we need to do in terms of project management, for the project managers in the room, we need to optimize our project management process for time around this cycle lead time. And this actually changes project management in some very important ways. So, in particular, managers driven by the financial people tend to optimize for utilization. 
for everyone being busy. So there is a school of management which is look and see if everyone's busy, and if everyone isn't busy, then find out why and make those people busy. And it turns out you can prove from Q theory that if you optimize for utilization, that's inversely proportional to lead time. So if you optimize for 100% utilization, you create the most inefficient process you possibly can in terms of lead time. And you can see this by imagining checking in to an, for a flight at an airport. If you have 10 check-in desks and there's people at all those check-in desks, you will get checked in quite quickly. But those people are there all day. They are not 100% utilized. They have very low utilization across the day. If you optimize for utilization, you might have one person behind the check-in desk. And that one person will be 100% utilized, but it's going to take you a very long time to get checked in. So, this is what happens in product development. If you optimize for utilization, your product backlog will never ever... I mean, you'll, you'll create the slowest process you possibly can for actually getting stuff shipped to your customers. You need to optimize for lead time to learn as quickly as possible for your customers, and that requires having slack in your system and not optimizing for utilization. And if all the people developing your products are working overtime all the time, there's something very badly wrong. Because not only, I mean, a century of industrial studies show that um, working overtime makes you stupid, and uh, you've also created a very inefficient process for actually delivering value to your customers. So it's important to consider that. Um, this actually has huge implications for the way we do product development. So this might sound very interesting uh, and like a radical new idea, um, or it may sound like a load of crap. Uh, and often that is the reaction to Eric Reese. It's like, well, this is all very theoretically interesting and you're a Silic Silicon Valley entrepreneur, but we actually have real customers and a large company and uh, we need to do real work. So uh, if you could just go back to Silicon Valley and carry on writing books, that would be fabulous and we'll carry on doing the real work. Um, so has anyone been to Barcelona and seen the Sagrada Familia, this church? Anyone? Okay, a couple of you. So there's a guy called Gaudi who was uh, an architect in Barcelona and um, he was a quite maladjusted mal child. Um, he was very nervous and he spent a lot of time in nature looking at flowers. And then he became an architect, which seems to be a popular profession for maladjusted people. And um, he ended up making a lot of changes to architecture. So at the time when Gaudi became an architect, the popular style was perpendicular. So a lot of things, churches and so forth, that were built used a style called Gothic perpendicular. And one of the things that Gaudi did is he invented new styles for architecture. So instead of having things with right angles, right angles are very popular in Europe for a long time, um, he came up with uh, a parabolic style where he used parabolic structures. And then he came up also with a hyperbolic design style where he used hyperbolic structures. Um, and, you know, this church, which is still not finished over a hundred years after work started on it, is a great example of A, the hyperbolic style, and also just being incredibly rococo aesthetically. I mean, aesthetically, it's amazing and it's totally nuts. And if you go and visit and look inside it, you're like, wow, that's amazing and slightly gross, but incredible. I mean, it's, it's really a fabulous building. But he used a completely different style, this hyperbolic style. And Architects and engineers will tell you that if you use a completely different style for building load-bearing structures that millions of people will be inside, that is risky. Because load-bearing structures that collapse kill people. And that's bad. So, when you change architectural style, it's incumbent on you to do a bunch of testing. Um, and so... When you look at what Gaudi did, he didn't create a large specification document and spend a lot of time on the specifications and then build it according to the specs. This is not how he built the Sagrada Familia. Instead, he spent a lot of time experimenting. If you go down into the crypt, you can see he was always creating scale models and building things with plaster to try and test out the ideas he had. 
And the hyperbolic style, this was not the first building he built with the hyperbolic style. He built a small church using the hyperbolic style to test that it would actually work. And before that, he was building a load of models. And there's this thing in the crypt that you can see. Of, um, he actually created an inverse model of his first church. And these little sandbags represent the, the loads on the structure, but using weights instead, inversely. So this is how he tested that the structure would support the loads that were put on it, which is really ingenious. I mean, what a smart guy to come up with this idea of testing the loads on the structure to make sure they would actually bear the weight. So he was forever coming up with smart ways to test and build scale models and test and build things before he actually went and built the church. So if you're building a truss bridge, which has known characteristics and it's linear and we've built lots of trust bridges before and it's designed in such a way that it can be modeled analytically, then yes, you can build a requirements document and then go and execute it and be pretty sure that it'll come in on budget, on time and with the expected quality and that it won't collapse and kill people. But if you're doing something that's a bit different, that's innovative, then you need to be thinking a lot about testing and getting feedback as part of the process. Building the specifications, coming up with the ideas, turns out not to be the constraint. The constraint is actually working out if people, if it will, if it will really work and if people will actually derive value from it. So people who say, well, we need to make software development more like engineering, what do you mean by engineering? Do you mean building trust bridges or do you mean building something like this? Engineers and architects who are building things that are a bit different do a lot of testing and are very highly iterative about what they're doing. And they know that the hard work is in actually building things and trying them out and iterating and experimenting, not in coming up with ideas for what to build and specifying them. So a great example of a company which seems to just not iterate at all and launch things with extreme fanfare, uh, apparently without doing any user testing, is Apple. And Steve Jobs famously says, I'm not going to ask customers what they want, I'm going to build something which I think is fabulous and screw my customers. So that would seem to be the anti-lean startup approach. Um, and so you know, anyone who's got a fundal slab, you know, that's the, the apex of anti-lean startup, you would think. So does anybody know what the first product developed by Apple is? Apple's very first product. Huh? The PC? Uh, I mean, it, it was a home computer. Um, Lisa, Apple One. Who said Apple One? Yes, correct. The Apple One. So let's have a look at the Apple One. It was very revolutionary for its time. Came out in, I think, 90, in 76 or 78, something like that. Um, it had, it had, uh, it had, uh, well, I mean, the, the keyboard was an additional extra. You had to have your own keyboards and you had to provide your own power supply, but it had uh, a display adapter so you could plug in a monitor. All the personal computers before that had switches and lights and key punches, but this actually had, you know, you could plug it into a television and you could connect a keyboard to it. And so it was very radical for the time. But it was still, you know, I mean, you could buy it in kit form and solder it yourself, or you could buy the pre-assembled circuit board and then build your own container and attach the keyboard. It was quite MVP, let's say. I mean, it was designed in, um, uh, in, the, sh in, in the, I guess, the garage of uh, uh, Steve Wozniak's parents' house. Um, and then they kind of showed it off at the local computer club. So, you know, A, B, A, B, kind of different in its approach. So actually, Apple do a lot of testing and user testing, but they just make the people who they do the user testing with sign some very strict contracts about the fact that they've done it. Um, and if you look at the Apple Macintosh, the Apple Macintosh was really the computer that led to mass market adoption of, of Apple stuff. Uh, beyond computer hobbyists. I mean, the Apple II was very successful, but the main market was computer hobbyists. The Macintosh was the first computer that professionals really bought. And if you look at the team that built the Macintosh, uh, there's a great um, site called folklore.org. And folklore.org is stories from the people who built the Macintosh. 
And there's a story by one guy, Andy Hertzfeld, who says this. Instead of arguing about new software ideas, we actually tried them out by writing quick prototypes, keeping the ideas that work best and discarding the others. And this is the important bit. We always had something running that represented our best thinking at the time. And they actually designed the computer with that in mind. So um, all the logic was built using programmable logic arrays, where you can reflash the PLA um, every time you want to change the way the logic works. So, and, and this was really revolutionary at the time. And they made it so that if they didn't like the way the logic worked, or they needed to change the logic, they could just flash it, plug in the PLA, reboot the computer, and try again. And then if it didn't quite work, well, let's debug it, and then let's flash a new PLA and plug it in. So they could be iterative about the hardware design as well as the software design. So they designed it with iterability and incremental design in mind. Um, and if you compare the Lisa, which was being built at the same time, the Lisa used a very formal waterfall y process. Um, and you know, they had horrible state creep, and it came to market later than the Macintosh, despite starting earlier. And uh, it, you know, <laughs> no one's heard of the Lisa because it didn't work. Um, in terms, I mean, it works if you turn it on and stuff, but you know, it didn't work in terms of actually being a valuable product. So the great thing about these people was that they were building stuff for themselves. So how did they know if they liked it? How did they know if it was valuable? It was valuable because they liked it. They were their own customers. And then it's quite easy to develop products if, you're, if it's to please you. So how many people are working in products that they are the target audience for? OK, a few of you. So lucky you. That's a great position to be in. Who is building a product for customers? Who is building a product that they would never buy for themselves? <laughs> OK, a few of you. Uh, not, I'm not saying because it's a horrible product. Who would buy... Who would buy who, who's building a product that's fabulous and wonderful, but probably isn't high on their priority list for things to buy? Let's put it that way. OK, so no one additional. If you're building products for people who are not you, you need to think about the people you're building products for. And so who's the personas? OK, a few of you. So this is uh, yeah, pretty much everyone. Yeah. Yep. I, I prefer, instead of dog feeding, I prefer drinking your own champagne. Because uh, <laughs> turns out most people don't like dog foods. But yes, so drinking your own champagne. Go on. You have a question? Yeah, I, I, the, the Google does it. So before they launch a test it out in the market, they have a smaller, less risky audience where they uh, test it out with their own employees. Yeah. Uh, sounds like a good idea. Yeah, I totally agree. So. Google test stuff out with their own employees. Um, yeah, I absolutely agree. If you can test it with on yourself and on people close by you, absolutely, I think that's really the best way to do it. And that's what we did with Go. We used it ourselves, and we found other people who wanted to use it, and we focused on getting people who would use it. I think that's absolutely the best way to go. But the, the, the problem is, if you're building something that you can't, I mean, champagne that is not for you, then what do you do? So yeah, step one, drink your own champagne. If you can do that, fabulous. If you can't do that, then you have a problem because you know if I'm building something which is a you know like I'll choose an extreme example, a pacemaker, I'm not going to dog food a pacemaker because I'll die. So I need to find some way to test that product. Um, so the question, you know, the, the problem is if you can dog food it, that's fabulous. That's the best way to proceed. If you can't, because the product is not for if you're not the target audience for that, what do you then do? And so this is where personas come in. And this is what we all do when we start building a product is, you know, get a copy of Vogue, um, at least that's my excuse, um, and cut out pictures of potential, you know, nice looking people from it and, you know, occasional ugly one for diversity reasons. And then put them up and kind of describe what those people are like. Um, and, uh, and those are your target audience kind of thing, um, which is great. There's this guy from uh, Menlo Park Innovations called Richard Sheridan, and he has this really nice exercise for personas where he creates a target like this. And you're allowed to put one persona in the middle, two personas in the second ring, three personas in the third ring, and so forth. And the, his point is, you need to have one persona who is your main target audience. And he says, this is the exercise that product owners find really difficult. 
choosing one persona to put right in the middle. Because everyone says things like, we want to dominate the sector, and, and things like this. And no one, you want to have a wide target audience. No one wants to do this exercise. It's really hard. Uh, he was working with uh, someone who was building a product for somebody else. And um, he went through this exercise and picked a persona. And he says, I can't relate to this person. And uh, Richard Sheridan says to him, how many of these widgets are you buying? And the guy says, none. And Richard Sheridan says, well, why should I care what you think? And the guy says, yeah, that's the area of your process I'm still having trouble with. <laughs> so it's hard to do this, and it's hard to realize, to actually put yourself really in the mind of the person who's buying your products, who is not you. Empathy. You know, people become technologists because they don't like talking to other people. That's why we become technologists. So empathy is not normally high on the list of skills that we're good at. You know, I'm speaking personally. Um, <laughs> I have a friend who's like this. Um, so this is a difficult exercise, but it's, it's really, really important. And to think about that one person who you're actually going to, who's going to buy your product and putting yourself into their mind. And then you need to find some way to measure the value to that person of the thing that you're building. So how do we measure value? Question. Yes. One who's going to buy your product or one who's going to use your product? Okay, so that's an excellent question. The person who's going to buy your product or the person who's going to use your product. And those can be two different people. So for example, Facebook, the people who use the product is, you know, uh, the Ahmadmi, the general person in the population. Maybe not the Ahmadmi, maybe the two Ahmadmi. Um, but the person who's the, the customer is uh, the, the advertisers, right? Two different people, conflicting interests potentially. So who are you actually measuring value for? And that's an important question. The flip side of that is, if people don't use Facebook, then there's no revenue for the advertisers. So that, that's a difficult problem. Uh, it's one I'm not going to address, <laughs> because uh, I, you know, I, I'm going to run out of time and I have a bunch of stuff to get through. But it's something you need to think about. Are you actually selling to the person who's paying? That, so that in XP, there were these two terms. There was the gold owner, and there was the goal donor. The gold owner is the person who's paying, and the gold donor is the person who's giving you the requirements. And if those two people are not the same, it creates conflicts. So you really have to think about that. And you have to represent both of those interests. And in that case, you know, the persona exercise becomes difficult. Who do you put in the center of that? Is that the advertiser or is it the user? Um, now, I don't know what Facebook were going to do, but if it was me, I would focus initially on the user. Because unless you have people who are using it, you cannot generate revenue. If Facebook went to advertisers and say, we have a social networking site with no users, will you pay, will you pay us money to advertise to our zero users? They would probably say no. So I think you really need to focus on the people who are using over and above the customers. And once you have, I mean, especially with social networking sites and you know, the networking effects, unless you actually leverage that, then you can't actually find money. And you know, cynically, you might say, well, this, this seems to be the case in Silicon Valley. Lots of users, no actual revenue. And that, that's a problem as well. But that's a second order problem, I would suggest. So how do we measure value? And this is really important, because measuring value is actually how you know that you've done a good job. So there's a bunch of different ways to do it. A-B testing. This is a um, technique that was developed by the people who send you junk mail. Now, not everyone gets the same credit cards letters offering you credit cards with high APRs. Um, everyone gets different ones. And what they do is they make those letters better based on who actually applies for the credit cards. Well, that obviously is a better offer letter and it's more compelling. So. It doesn't have a great history as an idea, you know, from junk mailers. And actually, if you look at Nigerian scammers, so you know the, Niger the emails you get, my uncle has died and I have $5 billion, those emails. You may have noticed over the last five years that the grammar has been getting worse and worse on those emails. They used to be very well written, now they're horribly written. The reason for that is because they were getting too many false positives. Too many people were applying, and then that's expensive because you actually have to talk to those people. So what they're doing by making the grammar and the spelling worse is they're selecting for the most gullible people. 
because those are the people who they have a high chance of being able to scam. So they've done something, and A-B testing produces surprising results, such as, in order to make money, we should make letters more and more incomprehensible. You wouldn't rationally, intuitively come to that conclusion, and yet it turns out, so A-B testing is useful because it comes to surprising results. Uh, and if you're focusing, as a Nigerian scammer is, on making lots of money very quickly, uh, you really need to think about how we can produce surprising results. And any web-based company uses this extensively. Um, Amazon famously uses it for everything. Uh, and in fact, if I was launching a product today, I would probably try as hard as I could to make it a web-based product just so I could do A-B testing so it, because it's such a powerful technique for actually getting real customer feedback because you're experimenting on your customers. You're not asking them what they want. You're saying, would you like this or this? And they don't even know they're being experimented on, which is the best possible scenario to so get feedback from your customers without, without knowing they're being experimented on because then you, you can connect directly to their subconscious, which is where you want to be connected to. You know, system A in uh, Kahneman's methodology, sorry, system one, the intuitive first kind of uh, part of your brain that makes those decisions without thinking about them. So the second way, you, the problem is you actually have to build stuff to do A-B testing. So is there a cheaper way to do it? Well, yes, you could show your prototype to real users. So Stephen Gary Blank, who came up with the idea of customer development and the Lean Startup, he has a saying, get out of the building. The answers are not in the building. The answers are outside. Get out of the building. And this is really important. And this is something we've done uh, at ThorWorks on projects. You know, we go out with some bits of paper, with some prototypes on them, to random people in coffee shops and in the street and show them stuff and say, if you wanted to do this, how would you do it if you saw this? And we watch them actually try and with, they're like, oh, I, maybe I'd press that button and then I'd do that. And you're like, no, that's totally not what you're supposed to do. And that's really important because then you know that your idea is rubbish and you need to fix it. Or you go out with an iPhone with some mock-ups and get them to try and, how would you accomplish this goal? And then they actually try and do it. And watching them may do a really horrible job of using your product is really important. And you can do this in a cheap, lo-fi way. You don't need to be Amazon or Google to do this stuff. You can just have bits of paper. So get out of the building, show things to real users, and the other thing is measuring business metrics. So it's really easy to get involved in vanity metrics, the number of hits on the website. Um, instead of business metrics, how much revenue are we actually making? Revenue per customer per unit time. Uh, actually focusing on growth in real business metrics is really important. And good A-B testing, it's not, you know, did more people click through from this page rather than this page? What you measure when you're doing A-B testing is how many people actually paid us money at the end of the workflow having come in on this page. So you always need to be measuring business metrics at the end, not vanity metrics. Oh, more people clicked on this page. And then you find out they clicked on that page because they had an erroneous assumption about the product that they then never bought. Rather than, well, less people clicked on this page, but more people who actually clicked through ended up buying the product. Uh -huh. So, for example, for tech to real users or to do A-B testing, there is um, a company called Paul Who that basically, if you have a really great idea, you put it out there, customers hopefully have a high traffic website that you're using, but they'll be able to very quickly tell you, yep, I really care about this one than this. What's, the, what's it called again? Paul Who. How do you spell it? Q-U-A-L-R-O-O. So that's Q-U-A-L-R-O-O. -O. So that's Reshma's Resh product recommendation. Amazon, off, sorry, Google offers Google Web Analytics, which is a free A-B testing framework for doing this stuff. Um, Google is really great to um, basically do um, surveys with your customers very, very quickly to get feedback. And there's a, there's a piece of software called, I think it's called Silverback, that allows you to do prototyping where you can actually just quick mock-up, show it to somebody, and then it actually um, shows where the customers looked at or, or touched, it's like 20 bucks. For, uh, a license and you can do What's that one called? It's, I think it's called Silverback. I'm not sure. Silverback. I think so. Okay. Silverback. Okay. So there's three products that you could try out. So, thank you. Um, so I just want to talk a bit about what you do once you've got feedback. So there's this example called Votizen, which was uh, showcased at Eric Reese's Startup Lessons Learned Conference. And the vision was to get 
people more engaged in public policy and more engaged with politicians. And I'm not going to go through what they did. I'm just going to say version one of the site. Um, they built it in six weeks with $1,206. And uh, they used these metrics. This is called the R framework. Acquisition, activation, referrals, retention, revenue. So it's sometimes called pirate metrics because it spells R. Um, so acquisition means someone actually came to your site. Activation means that when they signed up, they clicked on the, on the email to actually activate their account. Referrals means that they sent somebody else to your site. Retention means that they came back to your site. And revenue means they paid you money. So version one of the site, they had 5% of people clicking through from the front page. 17% of the people who did that then activated their account. But no one, no referrals, no retention, no revenue. So they iterated a bit until they got to a local maximum, which was 70% acquisition, 90% activation, fabulous, 4% referrals, 5% retention, but no revenue. And they couldn't get any further by iterating on that. Yes? So they came up with a, a they came up with an idea for how the site would work, and that was one. And then based on kind of A-B testing and customer feedback, they iterated and changed the layout and changed the links, but didn't change the basic, the, the basic user workflow. So the user workflow is kind of stayed the same, but they just you know, did A-B testing to make the site more, um, you know, more interesting. And, but the basic business model stayed the same between 1 and 1.1. So they got as far as they could with this is the model for how we're going to get customers engaged. And I think it was something like sending... No, no, no. Just to 1 to 1.1. And then, and their basic business idea, I think, I can't remember exactly, but it was something like sending emails to your representative. Something like that. Um, and so what they did is they realized they couldn't get any further with this particular strategy. And so they pivoted. And they came up with some completely different idea for how people would engage with the political process. And again, I can't remember the exact details, but it was, they had to redo the whole site. Completely different set of ideas that they, they built from scratch, which was version two. And all these I mean, basically the, the net result was they actually started making some money. But 1% was not good enough in terms of actually achieving their business goal. And so they pivoted again. <laughs> And all the other metrics looked really, really like they were improving until they got to 0% revenue. And that was bad, so they pivoted again. And finally, they got to the stage where they were getting 11% revenue. But the important thing to bear in mind from this is that you will have to change your strategy. It's People think, well, we're going to execute this plan, and then we're going to iterate. No. Your first strategic plan for how you will get deliver value to your customers will be wrong. And your second one will be wrong too. And your third one will probably be wrong as well. And this is something that don't, people don't sufficiently account for. The fact that their first and second and third ideas will be wrong. Some huge proportion of startups fail. And I think the ratio of product ideas to working products is something like 25 to 1. So that should be sobering. People should not plan for their first idea being successful. They should plan for their 25th idea being successful. Which means that you need to manage the cost of your failures and do them as fast as possible. So um, this has an effect on, your, on the way you do analysis. We're used to stories. Everyone, who uses agile stories? As a, uh, I want, mm, so that, yay! <laughs> Who's doing that? OK, all right. Good, congratulations. <laughs> um, so that's all very well, but this whole idea of requirements, that we know what we want and you must, we must do it and then we will get this, is basically wrong. We have no guarantee that we're going to deliver that value. So a guy called Jeff Gothelf is releasing a book next month, March, still February, uh, called Lean UX. And he's come up with this idea of hypothesis-driven delivery. And the idea is that we shouldn't talk about requirements. We should talk about hypotheses. And so instead of the story model, he says, you know, we believe that building this feature for these people will achieve this outcome. We'll know when we're successful when we see this signal from the market. Which I think is a much better way to frame 
the things we build. What's the signal from the market? What's the measurable customer outcome that we expect to deliver? And frame all your requirements in this way. And that forces you to, A, to realize that it's a guess, and B, to focus on how you're going to measure the value for that. Uh, and so that, that's like number one thing we need to do once we have our idea. And then we need to think about what's done. So I'm keen on saying that done means released in continuous delivery. That's what I say. But um, Grokit, uh, which is a company that Eric Ries talks about in his book, he says user stories were not considered complete until they led to validated learning. So released is not enough. You have to have metrics that tell you whether the idea was a good one in the first place before you can say you're done with the feature, which I think is a radical idea. You know, we talked about what's the measurable outcome. You can't say you're done with the story until you have that measurable outcome, until you have validated learning on your idea. So this changes the way we think about the agile development process. Instead of having requirements and then radically we're only done until we release them to customers, you know, dev complete isn't enough. Um, that's actually not good enough. We need to be thinking about hypotheses and we're not done until we have you know, real metrics that demonstrate that our hypothesis was either proven or disproven. Um, and I think a really important thing to consider is will people actually use your stuff when you're thinking about value? Yes? yes. You're concerned about analysis paralysis. Basically, the idea will spend yeah. so much time thinking about things, we'll never actually yeah. do anything. If it comes to the point, build it, test it, and then abolish it, most likely it is crap. Yep. Yeah. But I think, you know, if you overload the language like this, I mean, if you would write our stories all like this, mm -hmm. then we would have, you don't know, in the backlog, 200 stories, and all are like we believe. Yeah, okay, so, so that's fair enough. And I, I think, you know, we're guilty of this in Agile. It's like, here's the template. And we're going to write all our stories like this. Yeah. And we did this with given when then as well. All our acceptance criteria needs to be given when then. So I'm not, I, I think that's a very good point. I'm not proposing that. I'm not proposing this is the format that everyone must use religiously and everything must be written like that. So that's absolutely a trap and we don't want to fall into that. This is an idea for how you can frame features. Yeah. And the point of it is Maybe to... Ethics, uh, uh, yeah. Huh? Yeah, at, at the beginning of the process yeah. of feature development, which is iterative, so you're doing it all the time, yeah. but it's at you know, the beginning of the life of a feature. And the, the point of it is to focus on what are we going to measure yeah. and the fact that we don't know <coughs> whether it's going to be valuable yet. So yeah, don't, don't focus on the form, focus on the function. And sometimes when I see these stories, I always think, okay, it starts with something, and at the end, it's the most important stuff, the acceptance criteria, or what, how you measure that you would be that you're done. Right. And Yeah, which is fair. So I'm, I'm, so I'm going to cut you short because I'm running out of time. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you need to think about actually getting something done and getting the, the feedback. That's the most important thing. And how, what's the shortest path to doing that? Again, we're focusing on lead time. How can we get feedback as fast as possible? So yeah, it's not this is the answer to everything and you must use this format. You know, it's part of the toolbox. And again, you need to focus on getting around that loop as fast as possible and getting measurable feedback as fast as possible. Thank you. 
So I think, you know, we, we focus a lot on measurement and learning. The most important thing is, are people actually going to use things? Um, and the problem is, as a, as a product owner, coming back to the product owner thing, I always used to think a lot about what I wanted to build um, and less about the people using it. Uh, and the thing to always keep at the back of your mind is this. Uh, this is written by a writer uh, and uh, an author. And the, the title of the blog post was, No One Wants to Read Your Shit. Which, you know, as an author, I think is something to bear in mind. Using a product is above all a transaction. The user donates her time and attention, which is a supremely valuable commodity. In return, you, the creator, must give her something worthy of her gift to you. So this is a high-level thing. You always need to be think, thinking about the fact that you're asking people to give their time to you. Uh, your vision of what you want to do, no one cares about that. People care about being able to accomplish their goals. And focusing on how people can accomplish their goals is the most important high-level thing you need to do as a product owner. So with that in mind, I'm going to revisit the product manager role. So what should we be doing as product managers? Number one, we need to create and communicate with the team a shared vision for how we want to change the world. What is the measurable customer outcome we want to achieve in terms of actually changing the world? And then work with the team to define the measurements and the single business metric which measures how successful you are as a product company or as a product developer. And then you need to run experiments to learn if your ideas are any good, which is where the hypothesis-driven delivery stuff comes in. And it's all about running experiments. How do we run experiments as fast as possible? Optimize our process for cycle time to get feedback from our customers and from each other as fast as possible, because that's how you learn as fast as possible. And really, the only true measure of productivity is um, not lines of code, not number of hours worked, how many experiments can we run? How fast can we learn from our customers and each other? And I'm now out of time, um, so I'm going to end it there.